In a world with fewer and fewer truly wild places, the place we're going to show you tonight is as close as you can get to a Garden of Eden. It's in Gabon, a country on the west coast of Africa, and it's called Langue Bai, which is the pygmy word for clearing. It's an untouched zone where until recently no human had ever been. And gorillas that live there are called naive gorillas. Naive because they've never seen people, and therefore they're not afraid when they do. What's it like to come upon a gorilla that's never seen a human before? You're about to see for yourself. There can't be many places in the world that are harder to reach than Gabon's Langue Bai. How far is the untouched zone from where we took off? We're about uh, probably 40 nautical miles. We set off on our odyssey with biologist Mike Fay from New York's Wildlife Conservation Society. And we flew for hours just above the treetops across an endless expanse of virgin tropical rainforest. These are called the Minguli Chutes. Drains all of northeastern Gabon. They're beautiful, aren't they? They're gorgeous. Landing on this dirt strip in the jungle was really just the beginning of the adventure. It's vertical and it's slippery. Ahead lay a punishing trek through miles of virtually impenetrable jungle that's teeming with all sorts of wildlife. Mike Fay believes he was the first person to ever explore this jungle when he walked 2,000 miles from the Congo to the coast of Gabon in an epic expedition supported by National Geographic. Now we're retracing part of that journey. Have you ever seen this falls before? Two years ago. You know, I discovered them, I found them. And this is only the second time anybody's ever been here. Ah! Slippery! But that was just a small bump in a long day of bushwhacking. Pushing on to the untouched zone, looking for gorillas and elephants, we found that the obstacles came in all sizes. Ants. Ants. Big ants. So what you have is all these guardians, which are the soldiers, and they kind of guard this highway. I mean, it's literally like a highway. If they come into your camp at night, there's big chompers on them. They get in your hair, they get in your tent, they get into everything. This. Ouch. 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 They got you. Ah. Ah, and you've got blood there. Mm. Let's get out of here. Hours later, giant elephant footsteps signal that we're getting closer to Langue Bai, the untouched clearing we're looking for. From now on, we have to whisper. This is the elephant highway. It comes from up north and it makes a beeline for the Bai. We're only about 500 meters from the Bai. Can I just ask you something? If we happen across an elephant, what do we do? We're gonna engage the elephant. Oh, God. Wow, Mike. Beautiful light after that dark forest. We're gonna climb up this thing? Yeah. Let's do it. From Mike Fay's improvised viewing platform, we get a glimpse of what the planet must have looked like eons ago. I can see an elephant there. It's huge. Look at those tusks. Langue Bai is a rare clearing in the heavy jungle canopy. 50 acres of grassland and swamp where animals congregate to drink and even to socialize. The amazing thing about this clearing is there are more big tusked elephants here than any place else we've discovered. I mean, animals with 40, 50 kilo tusks. That's 100 pounds each. Yeah, these things are like mammoths. <laughs> Most of the big tuskers have been killed off already, even in relatively deep forests. So this is real rare, what we're seeing. Oh, yeah. It's one thing to see these massive creatures from a perch in the trees, but what about coming face to face with them on the ground? Usually they bluff charge and they try to scare you and they flare their ears out and they Wah! But they can stop. Many, many times I've had an elephant trunk no more than six inches from my nose and nothing happens. And this particular elephant decided to go all the way. And what happened to you? I was too close. So I turned around and ran and she was already airborne. You know, she was already on, on the way to stabbing me in the back. And so I caught the tusks on the way down and just went Oh my word. On the ground and her tusks went right into the sand, just like 
and her eyeball was like four inches from my eyeball. We're kind of looking at one another. Mike Fay says elephants range so far, they know what humans can do to them, and they fear them. I don't think there's a single elephant on the planet anymore that doesn't know what a human is, because they travel long distances. But gorillas only go five or ten kilometers in a radius. They, they um, have never seen human beings. They're the so-called naive gorillas, and we had come a long way to see them. And our first sighting was a dominant male known as a silverback, lumbering into the clearing. What we've discovered is that the gorillas are not those ferocious beasts that we see in, in the movies. They're very gentle, very reserved, very thoughtful animals. Unless they're competing for a female's attention. The males, they don't take females, they have to attract them. And so what these guys do is they just tear around these clearings back and forth, back and forth, and splashing the water and making a big show. And then, boom, they strut and they look, like, who's looking at me? And they can see those girls over there looking at them, you know? Is there such a thing as a handsome gorilla? Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> there are ugly ones, too. And a lot of them have scars, and, you know, some of them have bright red caps, and some of them are real buff. So, yeah, they're it's just like humans, basically. That night, we camped out in the jungle, near a watering hole. So what are the chances that overnight any kind of wildlife will come here? About 100 percent. Like what? Elephants. I mean, you know, we're right in their path. Is that smart? They smell our fire, they're just going to run away. Next morning, we headed even deeper into the jungle. Mike, why are we going through the densest underbrush? It's where the gorillas like to be. It's where it's the buggiest and nastiest, but that's where the gorillas love it. The forest was full of exotic monkeys. They'll come in, the alpha males come in to protect the group. But when Mike Fay crossed these forests for the first time three years ago, what he found truly amazing was the reaction of these gorillas that had never seen people before. Gorillas and chimpanzees, when they're completely naive, they recognize you as a fellow primate. They see your head, they see your arms, they see your fingers, and they think, they're just like us, you know, but they're not. They're something different, and they walk around on two feet, and they're, and they're all just like, hey, look at this, you know, and they'll actually go get their buddies and say, look at this, man, this is really amazing. The great-great-grandparents haven't seen humans, so they can't kind of pass down that fear, that instinct to say, humans are predators, they're bad. Mike Fay's mission is to protect these animals, and to tell the world that this forest is threatened. One of his partners took these pictures of loggers cutting down Gabon's valuable trees 80 miles from where we were, and Faye worried the same thing would happen here. Some of these trees have been here for 1,000, 1,200 years, and these guys just come in and... And then come the poachers, because the loggers have made it easy for them to penetrate this jungle on the roads they've carved out. Illegal hunting is now big business. These guys have always eaten those species. Gorillas, chimpanzees, monkeys, antelope, they've always been on the menu. But they've never had the ability to kill 100% of the animals in the forest before. That's what's changed. You know, they have guns, they have roads, they have transportation, they have enormous markets that they can go to. And Faye took us to one of those markets, hundreds of miles away in the capital Libreville, where we found animals like the ones we've just seen in the wild, sold as bush meat. Cameras are not welcome here, so we had to film these scenes secretly. We've got pigs, porcupines, the mustache monkey, the putty nose monkey, dwarf crocodile. It's pretty sickening, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Mike, what's that? That looks like a chimp. Yep, it was a chimpanzee. This is the piles of chimp meat. This is definitely a no-no. Absolutely, 100% a no-no, yeah. That's because chimpanzees and gorillas are protected species. It's illegal to hunt them. 
We also saw stalls that specialize in traditional medicine and witchcraft. That's a gorilla head. Look at that. What do they want a gorilla hand for? For the power. Because these fingers are just incredibly strong. So that's where that belief comes from because this is probably the strongest hand on earth. So a lot of these animals are killed just for sort of fetish value. Gorillas are killed for the meat. They're not going to be killed just for hands. Another problem has been that they sell the, the, the orphan babies as well on the open markets. Fay and his fellow conservationists have rescued so many orphan gorillas that have survived hunters and human encroachment all over Gabon, they've had to find a place to raise them. We took a boat trip upriver to their new home, an isolated forest that's just been declared a national park. When Mike Faye started his expedition, Gabon had no national parks, so none of this was protected. Almost all the forests had already been sold off to the loggers. But Faye stopped all that by personally persuading the president of Gabon to set aside 11% of his country as national park land. And now, Faye and his friends are trying to make sure that for generations to come, there'll always be animals in these parks. All right, there's Liz. Good morning. Hello. Liz Pearson from the John Aspinall Foundation is a sort of surrogate mother to the orphan gorillas, like this one called Chimbele. <laughs> you are so cute. She's the only survivor of a family of 22 naive gorillas who were slaughtered by poachers. Good girl, she said. Good chap. Pearson's trying to do something no one has ever managed to do before, return them to the wild. But that's difficult because many of the gorillas Pearson it's nursed okay, back to health I... act just like children and don't want to break the bond they've formed, like five-year-old Evindo. Why is he making those sad faces? He wants to come and say hello to you. He's not sure whether he can or not. Oh. Oh. It's okay. It's okay. Mm. Hey. Oh, Evindo. He had a really uh, tough time of it. It took months before we were sure he was going to stay alive. He was dehydrated. He had um, been attached at the, the waist, so he had, had cuts, deep cuts. It was round the clock care. How difficult is it going to be to return Evindo to the wild? I mean, he's so attached, he's like a baby. Uh, <laughs> Aren't you trying to discourage this kind of behavior? Uh, yes. <laughs> but emotionally, gorillas seem to be, they're just very sensitive. And if we don't develop a bond, they won't eat. Mm -hmm. We say the lights will go out of their eyes and they die. They're difficult to, to keep alive. Let's go for a walk. So Pearson and Faye showed us another group of gorillas in a nearby clearing that had already been released back into the wild. Every single one of them is, is kind of a, a different scenario that under, unfolded in the forest, you know, with poaching and, um, you know, killing the group. It's, and then these guys okay. are left over. He's, he's smelling you. He's, he's pulling your hair. Yeah. Marco is the head of this gorilla clan, and he won't let anyone near the others until he checks us out. I feel like I'm in an airport being compressed. In a few years, this gorilla will be a giant silverback, the dominant male, who will sire the next generation. Fifty years from now, when most gorillas are gone, experiments like this are going to be very important. Hmm? You can be ready to go back in the woods by yourself. You can be able to find food without me. I bet you will. I bet you will.